Welcome everybody. We thank you for joining us on time as we're admitting folks into the room. Please bear with us. So we give time to folks to get their computers working, their audio working. And I'll do that just for a few more moments and we'll get started, but hopefully everybody's had a good morning or a good start to their morning, depending on where you're coming from. It's great to see so many familiar faces on the line. No matter where you're coming from, good morning, good afternoon. Tumanam, tumanam, buju, yate apenet. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's session is going to be the first in our series of six sessions. It'll focus on being a good relative. Making sure our background folks are here to help me out too. Thank you so much. I'd like to acknowledge, take the time for just a few moments to acknowledge our colleagues in the field. Some of my coworkers are here. Thank you for joining and supporting, as well as some of our consultants I see on the line. So thank you all for being a part of today's session as well to kick off the series in a really good way because it's important to think of the ways that we take care of ourselves, take care of each other, and support each other in our journey. And we're approaching a time of year where sometimes we forget the importance of self-care. The importance of being good to one another um, because we get so busy with life's activities. Um, just a few reminders as I get ready to get started. Um, this session is being recorded, so be mindful of that. You'll have the opportunity to engage with our presenter and myself um, at different moments of the session presentation and your, the rest of your participants that are online with you. And you can always post something in the chat if you have something important that you'd like to share quickly. Uh, I'll be attentive to the chat. But as we get started, if you want to put who you are, where you're joining us from, uh, whether it's Iowa, our university is located, or somewhere else in the lower 48 or Alaska, it'd be great to see who's on the line with us. So you're welcome to just post your name and where you're joining us from. I'm Dr. Allison Bays. I serve in the Prevention Technology Transfer Center. And this is, like I said, the first session in our series of six, Being a Good Relative. And we're looking at healthy prevention opportunities during this winter season, how we can take care of ourselves, how we can take care of one another and continue on a good path, continue in a good way as we find that connection to our culture, to our traditions, and so as I begin to share our screen, my screen for everybody, I just wanna invite you all to make sure you've muted your mics. Put who you are in the chat box for us to see who's online with us today and consider what are some ways that you're going to continue to be a good relative in your journey and look at healthy prevention ways we can continue to grow and stay connected to our culture during the winter. As many of you know, you've been on our sessions before and we thank you for that. Uh, we are one of 12 centers across the country that serve communities in the field of prevention science. As one of two offices, we are a national serving office for our tribal communities, American Indian, Alaska Native, Prevention Technology Transfer Center. We have the opportunity to serve not just in one location or region, but throughout the lower 48, as well as Alaska. Tribal communities, both urban and rural, rural um, come to us for technical assistance, guidance, help, and training sessions like the one today. So if you fit into that category where you may have a need to have a specific training or session in your area, please reach out to us. At the end of today's session, you'll be given some information to send us an email, send something to our team, and know that we can assist you. This is the prevention office, but we also have the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center and the Addiction Technology Transfer Center. 
We have a supplemental program that services K through 12, as well as a trauma stress initiative program. So please know that you can check out our website and look for many resources from our team, from our centers, from my colleagues. Our office is supported by a grant from the SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The content of our presenter today is her creation and the opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of HHS, our office or SAMHSA. We are highly encouraged by the great news she'll be sharing and her expertise that she brings to our center. At the end of our session today, there'll be a few things to be mindful of. Um, after the session is over, in a few weeks, you'll be sent an email as a follow-up, which will include the link to the presentation slides, the recording of today's session, and any other things that will support you in this series. Um, we have several dates coming up, which I'll post in a few moments. And then what's really important to our team is that you take some time to do the post-event survey. You'll see that link here on the screen in front of you as well as the QR code. Some of you like to use your phones and capture that. And we invite you to please take that um, opportunity to provide feedback to our team so we can understand what we are doing and how we are helping you in a good way and what we can do to improve upon our services. It's really important to us to have the feedback from you. Please note that this is an anonymous um, assessment um, survey and cannot be traced back to you. And we invite you to please take the time to do that after our event today. This session is being recorded. Please make sure that your microphones are muted. Although we're gathered virtually today, it's really important to our team, to our tribal communities, to take this time to acknowledge the land and pay respect to the indigenous nations whose homelands were forcibly taken over and inhabited. I invite you now to take a few moments just to read this land acknowledgement that was created by three of my former colleagues, Ella Driscoll, Keely Driscoll, and Sean Bear, all from the Squawky Nation. As I mentioned, this is the first in a series of six sessions focusing on how are we supposed to be a good relative to one another during the winter months? What are some areas for prevention in our daily lives? And a few months ago, our prevention team came together and talked about what social wellness looks like for our tribal communities, both urban and rural. And a document was created to focus on all the good work that our ATTTC office has provided as well as our mental health office and the prevention office. And this link on the right side of your screen will take you to this document that you see here in front of you. There are several opportunities that we've done in the past that you can view on our website and several upcoming um, opportunities that you can take advantage of. For example, our virtual native talking circles, which I think comes in on Monday afternoons or, or Mondays at some point. Um, and then there are different sessions that are ongoing. If you can take the time after today's session that you can look at how we can make connections with one another, take care of ourselves as well as take care of others. How can we be good to ourselves by staying active during the winter months? How can we create better bonds with our relatives, with our family and with our children? It's so key in building healthy relationships as we form, as we shape good habits for today's living. And during these winter months, we want to make sure that we give you a head start to all of that, depending on where you're at, where you're coming from. You know, we know, um, as I'm located here in Minnesota, the snow's been here for a few weeks already. So we've already delved into the winter months. We want to be sure that folks are able to see how they can take advantage of maintaining healthy, 
prevention opportunities during the winter. These next few slides will just show you a few things about the schedule for social wellness and prevention during the series. Today is our first session, speaking on the idea of caring for ourselves and transitioning into winter. We have Dr. Quesada who will be addressing that. The other sessions will be on December 20th, which will focus on weaving our culture into our healing as we carry on traditions. Session three, be looking at our art and traditions to tell our stories. It will take place on January 17th. January 31st, we'll be telling our stories through songs and the written word, important aspects of our culture. In February, we'll have our final two sessions on the 14th as we look at how do we care for our elders. We know for many, many years, our elders have share their wisdom, shared cultural tradition with us. So how do we in turn help them maintain a healthy path, a healthy journey? And lastly, in February 28th, we'll be we look at how do we connect all of this through the lifespan, our journey collectively as a tribal community. All of these will be posted on our website and this information will be shared with you after today's event. So you can put them on your calendar and be a part of the remaining five sessions after today. Our speaker is Dr. Vanessa Quesada, and she is Kickapoo, Chichimeca, and Spanish Chosky. She's a pharmacist by trade and a plant person. So the knowledge base that she has comes from both traditions, our native tradition, as well as Western tradition. So it's a, a blending of the two. She is a co-founding member of Sanarte Healing and Cultura Clinic based in San Antonio, Texas. Traditionally, we call it Yanawana. She works in the intersections of native traditional healing, food sovereignty, and renewable energy to build life-giving systems. And some of you may have seen her once or twice before as she led our summer series, Native Food as Medicine. And she will continue to support our native communities by sharing today and in the next several months. So with that, I welcome Dr. Quesada. Thank you, Dr. Bays, for the invitation. And I'm so thankful to share today with you all. I'm happy to see the chat and that uh, there's people from all over Turtle Island joining us. So I want to share um, a greeting with you. And this presentation as being a good relative, caring for ourselves and transitioning into winter. As you will see, um, there will be some elements of Native food as medicine, uh, movement, care caring for ourselves and for others. I wanna first begin that I am connecting to you through Yanawana, uh, our homelands here. It's uh, original caretakers are the Poeteco and the Stokna peoples. Um, that's us in ceremony. I am Kekapu and Chichimeca from, uh, Kekapu from my dad's side, Chichimeca from my mom's side. And this is a picture on the left of my family um, with my, at my grandparents in front of my grandparents' house. And as I started to prepare this um, presentation, it really brought me into uh, the season of winter. And uh, both of my grandparents, three of my, three, three out of the four of my grandparents all transitioned during winter. Um, and so it's, it's definitely a time of lots of transitioning and uh, grief and things come up. And so this is uh, just a, a brief introduction to my family. And on the right, um, we are being led on a prayer run in Yanawana by our spirit elder runner, uh, David Sandoval. So we are actively as the middle generation um, stepping into those roles as what it is to protect and care for our home place, um, for our people. And also, uh, you can see we are in an urban environment. And so it's also intertribal, you know, being open to working with other natives of other tribes. 
Our overview for today is uh, the overall for transitioning into winter. Uh, we will, I started, decided to focus on stress and emotions because balancing the nervous system really gives us a foundation for being able to step into all of the other roles and responsibilities that we have in our communities. And so first and foremost, we're here, right? And uh, so we'll start with that. And then we'll start to move into caretaking with presence, mind, body, and spirit. And in this process of caretaking, how do we take care of ourselves and be present with others? We'll then move into mindfulness, indigenous mindfulness and neuro decolonization very briefly and really talk about what are the different ways that we can incorporate mindfulness into our life and why is that so important? Also, how are we nourishing ourselves, right? We're nourishing ourselves, we're having to focus on our mind and be mindful and um, also keep that balance with that we have enough fuel to really continue uh, to care for ourselves in our community, we need to really focus on bringing in as many traditional foods from our territories as possible. And in that there's healing, not only for us, but for our territories and our communities. And closing it up with healing and community. Uh, sometimes healing can be a charged word that seems really challenging and heavy and all of these things. And so we'll talk about ways that we can do simple things in our community that are accessible for folks to connect. And I'll share some examples in our community, um, how this has opened up really beautiful spaces for us to be able to continue and um, gather strength uh, from, from the land and from each other um, in different ways. So I'm going to first start off by uh, seeing if folks will join us in the chat again, because um, I was really happy how many people were responding in the chat and wanted to see if folks could type into the chat, what does winter mean to you? What is that season about? And I think that's important for us to really start to Maybe even take a moment to close your eyes and acknowledge and connect to the season that we're in. And the cycles of the earth and that this cycle is very specific in the way that the land is moving and uh, doing its own work, right? And all of creation is working together in this way and we are in turn being asked to also move along in these ways. Um, so if folks wanna join us in the chat, please share what winter means to you. And I'm gonna pause this share so that I can look at this chat. Chris says, cold, very cold. Karen says, I was born in the winter. No one else in my immediate family was a winter baby. It makes me special. Tashina says, winter means warm food, brisk air, falling rain, blankets, joy. Says the world simplifies and rests, snow and cozy nights by the fire, time to knit and weave, rest and slow down. Rest, winter means rest and renewal. Time to slow down. Michael in Oklahoma, slowing down as much as possible, but also taking the time to think and prepare for the next growing season as winter doesn't last long here. <laughs> yes, that is happening lots of places where we joke in, in here in Yanawana in Texas, it, it goes from uh, just summer to winter. <laughs> we skip spring and fall. Hardy stews, bear hibernation time, going inward, resting, crafting, build models, paint during the winter months. Anum in Yakima is we are preparing for winter solstice, a holy night where we dance on our knees and thank creator. Thank you for that contribution, twice beautiful. Cheryl Bay, sleep and renewal, rebirth and grow. Jean, winter means story time. Ooh, there's lots. 
of responses. I'll give you all a second to read some of those as well. New beginning, change and cleansing. Clever, simple way to symbolize the record. The passing of time, cold, dormancy, gathering together, preparing spring. Amazing. All of these are winter. <laughs> and I really enjoy um, hearing from you all and acknowledging the wisdom that is with each and every one of you, all of your territories and your cosmovisions. Um, and for us to come together in this way, uh, to have a similar understanding and um, just be in this reflective place, right? Because that's what this is, this time is calling on, on us. And um, this was a photo that I took when we were prayer running up north. And it talks about the key of life on the land is being prepared, paying attention, being aware of the weather. Then the stars, the animals, and the plants, we have to know where to find your food and how you can get it. Uh, this is particularly important in winter. And uh, you must know where the snow is too deep to travel and, and how much daylight you have left to track the moose. So it's when the daylight shrinks and we start to come inward like the plants, like the trees. We start to conserve our energy. Um, and what does that mean for us as humans in relation, you know, what are we seeing in all of creation reflected back at us? showing us what we should be doing and how we should be taking care of ourselves. So as I said before, we're gonna focus on these five things. And as we transition into winter, one of the first things that we think about is sleep. So someone mentioned that in the chat. <laughs> sleep is the number one thing that helps us to balance our nervous systems. So coming from this medical mindset, um, anytime someone comes in for a psychiatric evaluation, uh, you know, motions and stress and feeling unbalanced, the very first question that we are asking them is, how are you sleeping? And the second one you all are familiar with is, are there any substance dependencies, right? And so it's really especially important for all humans, knowing that sleep, is, sleep deprivation is a form of torture, that we are sleeping. And it's sometimes, it sounds like a very simple thing, <laughs> but there have been several times, myself included in my life, that um, sleep gets away from us. And there's a whole slew of different reasons why that is. But a lot of the research shows that we need seven and a half hours of sleep at least. Your chances of needing less than that to function fully as a human um, are your same chances of getting struck by lightning. <laughs> so sleep, I cannot stress it enough, is the number one thing that um, if we aren't getting that sleep to start asking ourselves those questions, why is that? Is there something, is there someone that just transitioned in my life? Um, am I experiencing some grief or stress or is my spirit calling me back into balance? Um, what are the roots of some of this uh, insomnia or anything that you may be feeling? Um, or just, you know, turning off the computers, turning off the screens a little bit earlier, dimming the lights before you go to sleep and creating that environment um, are all helpful ways to improve upon sleep. Exercise. So I have my conversations with my friends, you know, and they're like, traditionally, we didn't do exercise. We didn't have to exercise or go to the gym. You know, you were carrying wood, you're chopping wood, you're carrying water. Um, lots of communities that, uh, you know, the the women or the ones that the femmes would carry the water and um, the weight, carrying that weight, right? And, and feeling that strength in our legs and really getting that circulation happening. So a lot of the research shows us that walking even 20 minutes a day helps to be act as an anti-inflammatory. It's like taking an aspirin, you know? Um, and if you're walking 15 minutes a day, even 15 minutes help to reduce mortality by 14% and extended people's life expectancy. Um, so really, you know, it doesn't have to be this huge endeavor that we're doing to exercise, start small, and then you can extend it out at whatever that means for you. You know, if it's 15 minutes of walking, 
um, start with that. Start with wherever your body is. If you're in a wheelchair, you know, then, you know, it's going to look different for you to get your movement. Um, you can still follow the paths and you're working your arms. And so really being compassionate um, with ourselves and just seeing if we can get out there four days a week, if possible, if that makes a huge difference. Fasting. So fasting, I feel like is something that a lot of folks ask about and are curious in because there's a lot of things that come out on the internet or get, you know, shared of what should I be dieting? Should I be fasting? And um, for, for Kickapoo and our tradition that we do a lot of fasting in the winter and um, always, always, always want to recommend guided fasting. So I don't recommend people fasting on their own if they've never done it before. Um, there are different fasts to do. There's traditional fasts that um, in your own community, you could look for a spiritual elder to guide, guide you in that process. Um, and, you know, really having, setting that intention and being supported to do that. Um, exists in a lot of different traditions. And um, also, you know, considering that if you do have any medical needs that the first place, you would also want to consult your physician uh, to see if there's something that is good for you. Um, there are certain people that should not fast or that um, we would want to be very careful and monitor while they're fasting, uh, type one diabetics and others. So it's really important to um, know where you are and to do a little bit of research, whether that's with your elders, um, in your community, folks in your community, and um, working with your physician as well. Inward reflection. Some of you said this as winter is a time of going inward and reflecting, restoring, composting, right? Some of this um, being able to be still and it's getting colder. Um, some of us have lots of snow and some of us do maybe not have as much snow, <laughs> but um, that's important for us to really follow this season, what it's asking us to do. And on an emotion, from emotional level, um, this is the time where not only we go inward with our senses, but also inward with our emotions. And it's a time that we, you know, there's not so many community events and things happening that you can go inward and really process, take the time to process all of those emotions, especially in the last couple of years um, that we have so much built up, um, that so much that's compounded trauma that's being exposed through the pandemic and, you know, as well as like as a service to all of our ancestors from our lineage, right, of, of doing this healing work of letting go of these emotions that have become trapped in our bodies. And there's also other ways to fast um, that can allow you, I know a lot of us live within, um, within a system where we are going to our jobs and it's not as um, easy for us or we have responsibilities with our families. We, it's harder for us to go sit on the land for three to five days at a time. And so intermittent fasting is also an option for folks. Um, in the medical world, I get a lot of questions about intermittent fasting and how healthy is it for us? Um, I would definitely say do your research. Intermittent fasting oftentimes um, has people eating within eight hours of the day. So if you think about when the sun is out, during those eight hours are the time that folks eat and then the rest of the 16 hours of the day, folks are resting. And it's that same kind of resting your body and allowing your body to restore internally through your organs. Um, but there's also a very important fast <laughs> that is not just with food, um, but with dopamine. So there's lots of evidence that's coming out that are coming out right now. And I've been listening to podcasts with psychiatrists and especially when we work with youth in the community um, that are our number one for prevention, right, for our prevention audience um, is really, you know, caring for our children in this way that we are helping to support them in an environment to help them not be around any screens, whether that's computers, whether it's video games and gaming, um, that's our cell phones, you know, every single one of us could 
really benefit from this. During the winter, our ancestors were staring at the fire, they were sharing stories, and the fire helped to activate the melatonin, it helped to activate all of these, um, like the phosphorus through our eyes. We would absorb all of these things that help to balance our body. And our physiology is changing because of these screens, because of these computers. And it's really important for us to grasp that need to shorten that time, whatever that looks for us in our, in our practice, um, but that there have been uh, evidence base and um, documented cases of people that have uh, severe refractory depression that are suicidal and have these suicidal thoughts. And um, when they and when they come off of those screens for one month and do not look at any screens, they have a complete restoration of their nervous system. And so this can be incredibly helpful um, for all of us in, in all of our communities. Caretaking others and being present. Um, this is a, I'm not gonna go through every single uh, recommendation here. Some of them are, are self-explanatory, but this really brings caretaking into our uh, awareness of usually lots of people transition, as I said earlier, during this time. Um, so there are folks that take their walk to the spirit world during this time. And there are many of us that have um, family members that have uh, illness that, um, that requires life support or that requires constant care. And so that is a really big part of this time. It feels heavier to do this work. And so we also, what are the ways that we can show up not only for them, but for ourselves, knowing that um, every time that we give, uh, I, I sat with this elder actually last night and he said um, he's on hospice and uh, he is, has really done some, uh, he was a boarding school survivor and he's doing some deep healing work for himself and for his people. And he feels like, uh, he shared that he's been broken open by this work and he, um, you know, really said that he, most of his life, he realized that he was afraid of life. He was afraid to really live. And he carries this deep medicine of being a Wesero or a bone worker. Um, and he has these gifts. And one of the things that he's flashing back to right now is remembering all of the gifts, all of the things that have been shared with him, people's presence. Um, so just remembering and feeling and, and realizing that as we do this work, as we have this honor to care for our um, families and our relatives and our communities uh, that this is also healing for, for all of our, our seven generations back and seven generations forward. And it's a gift um, that you know, we can ask if there are labor, things that we can do physically that helps us to exercise, right? And take care of ourselves as we clean their house or uh, wash dishes or cut some wood or start the fire for them. Um, my my mother-in-law is, um, on life support. She's been on life support for three years and with her intestines. And um, oftentimes I don't know what's happening with her. I don't know. Um, all I know is that she's in pain, right? And, and she doesn't either. And so when I'm with her, I put my hands on her. I offer her like a light foot rub and it just helps her body to just relax. Even if you don't know what you're doing, right? <laughs> you can just place your hand, um, offer a little bit of light touch, a little massage, or even just placing your hand on their hand. Um, knowing someone's there and feeling that touch, something that so many of us, especially that are uh, recovering from a lot of trauma, it helps our nervous system to relax and it helps us to be open. And for that person to also go inwards to see what they need, um, being present, laughing, and then mentally, you know, folks that we're caretaking are not necessarily always mentally clear. So how can we be there reminding them and asking them questions, eating, how are you eating, sleeping, feeling, listening to them uh, with curiosity, you know, following their stories wherever they want to go, smiling, offering nonverbal communication, um, gratitude, 
folks that are chronically ill uh, really need to hear from people outside of themselves that they're not a burden, that they are valuable, that they have things to give and share. And so asking story, story time from them um, is, is really wonderful to really share and reflect back their value as a person and their dignity. Um, and then spiritually offering, of course, a prayer uh, a ceremony. It can be as, as simple and also as um, powerful as praying with a glass of water, you know, and sharing that glass of water together, um, sharing a song, playing an instrument, um, asking about the language, you know, tracing that back together. So many of our elders, you know, carry so much of a library for us and really being able to um, ask them those tough questions of what is it that they want their legacy to be? You know, having them to see, you know, it gives them peace to know that what they're leaving and that they can feel at peace, you know, and, and any way that we can support that and, and to help them, you know, to ask those difficult questions um, is, is really incredible and helps, um, helps us all to heal. Neurodecolonization, indigenous mindfulness. So all of this whole presentation is about healing, right? <laughs> um, and making it more tangible and accessible for us. And um, if you haven't heard of Dr. Michael Yellowbird's work, um, he has some ama amazing presentations and he really talks about this need to uh, activate ourselves to uh, decolonize through neurally, through the neurons specialized cells that we have in our brain, um, they are they make paths, pathways through our brain. So as we've been exposed to colonization for 500 plus years, this process of colonization has literally changed the pathways in our brain. And this activity to decolonize is to weaken those effects and to repattern our brains um, because our brains are are, they have plasticity, they can change just like we can. Our DNA, we inherit uh, the trauma and the resilience, but we have the power to take time for ourselves to activate, activate that resilience so that the trauma doesn't take over, right? And, and when we have, um, we're working with populations of folks and in, in our communities that um, we, we have lots of trauma, right? And part of that, um, of that work to is to remind each other, you know, that this that that compassion and that we are in this process of this bigger picture of decolonizing, and what that looks like for us in our daily life is to promote these traditional practices. It's to sit with these elders and and with all of our loved ones and um, to take the time for ourselves. And that this can look like um, a practice that's called mindfulness <laughs> in a lot of different traditions, but that this practice has existed within our people. There are indigenous ways of being, right? That our mindfulness now, or that we all now recognize as mindfulness. And really um, this, this definition, I really appreciate. Um, and just talking about mindfulness in a way that's accessible that like, it's just being okay with where you are in the moment <laughs> and so understanding that you have opportunities for growth to act on when you're ready. A lot of us like in our minds, we get in this like hamster wheel of wanting to be somewhere and wanting to do something. And, um, and those are the things that we have to start to turn and look at and acknowledge where we're at and to take those time, those steps in our own ways. And so, it can be, you know, thinking about our traditions before and how, how would we mindfully eat? Would we eat in front of the TV <laughs> or video games? Or would we, would we sit with that food, you know, our, um, even just one or two generations back or even today folks are cooking with the fire, right? It takes lots of time and, and focus to work with the fire and to make that food and giving that food its respect to take the three to five minutes to put the computer or the, the cell phone away and breathe in that food 
to smell the food, to say that Thanksgiving prayer, whatever that looks like for you, to for where that food has traveled from, all the hands that have touched it, uh, the, the water, the rain that has come, and all of those things to acknowledge and be and, and connect with your territory, um, even if you're in an office building or wherever you may be, um, that mindful breathing and what they call meditation um, is also for us something that we uh, do when we talk to the trees and when we um, sing a song, you know, there's so many different ways of, um, of meditating and uh, each of us in our own language has different words, um, words for what it means to be a human, right? And to take that time um, to be who we are. And so we, sometimes we need reminders for this, right? So um, one of the recommendations that he makes is to take two to five minutes um, each hour. And, you know, that sometimes that first requires us setting a timer uh, on our cell phone or on our watches. And just every two to five minutes on the hour, just taking that time to take that breath, shift our eyes away from the computer, do a little stretch, take some breaths, acknowledging you're breathing in and you're breathing out. And doing this with anybody that you're working with, whether it's um, your community, the youth, um, folks, the groups, you know, that you're working with and, and drinking that water together. Um, so that's, and there's many, many benefits to, to doing and to activating. And, and because each of these practices, each of this way of being that we already have, that we are coming back to um, as, as we make that time for ourselves to be who we are, to live and walk in our traditions, it decreases cortisol, you know, in a medical sense, it decreases cortisol, it, um, which is our stress hormone. It, it really helps to boost the biological and immune parameters. Um, and it helps to bring down the ones that have the negative effects on our bodies. So instead of being in this stressful, stressful time, and you think about, okay, when you're reading the news online or something, you know, that you get all stressed out and your mind doesn't see the difference. It feels like you're living it. So if we're looking at something on Instagram of the, the most traumatic one I feel like I've seen is uh, where there's just like a fire in the middle of the ocean. And that affects my whole nervous system to, to know that that's happening on the earth right now. And a lot of our um, a lot of our people, like we are sensitive to that. We know that the, we're in these transitional times and we're holding a lot uh, from the earth. And so it's really important for us to, to really be able to talk about that and give our body time to process it um, psychologically. So one of the ways that we practice um, mindfulness in uh, our indigenous mindfulness in our community um, is called uh, we there's practice that we do with community it's called Yolchikawa so that comes from Nahuatl language of heart power and strength um, and it's a series that really starts off with us um, smudging folks in the space and um, so we start off with some kind of medicine you can't always burn smoke in a lot of different spaces so if we're outside, we can light smoke, but sometimes uh, we will use like oils and medicines that we make with plants and flowers to start to wake up the senses. So that sense of smell, it connects to our brainstem and it helps us to open up that memory, right? It helps to open up the memory. It helps us to feel safe when people smell these medicines of the sage or the kopal or the um, sweet grass and then we do some movement. So we do some movement um, and you can see up, up on the left, folks are doing some stretching and some movement. I encourage folks to really like look into different movements from different places. Um, there's so many different commonalities uh, of different movements and the way, and they often will align with uh, the universe, right? And so they have specific sacred numbers, uh, specific movements that when we start to um, move in these ways, it helps us to realign and reorient uh, to the universe in a bigger way. We do some breath work after that. So 
some breathing, some intentional breathing, we find that um, it's, it's a little bit difficult for folks, especially for the youth, to just sit down and meditate, right? And folks that have um, substance use backgrounds as well, right? It takes time for our uh, nervous system, for the dopamine and all the different uh, like physiological effects in our body to, to level out. And so sometimes we need that movement. We need to get things out before we can be calm. And so that's why we do this in this order. We do some movement, we do the breath work, and then we get into this place where we, we are getting into our bodies and then we're laying folks down. So as they lay down, that becomes the meditation. Um, we find that in community, that's a little bit easier because we're not trying to have people think about it too hard. They don't have to sit in a certain way. They don't have to do anything besides lay down and rest. And that rest is where they get messages. That's where we, and then we, we share, we play. That's um, my partner, my duality husband Hedda and I, and we play instruments and we share the medicine of these instruments and um, this vibrational medicine, right? And, and some of our um, instruments from our territory, the water drum and, um, and our voices, right? Our voices and we say affirmations because all of these things help to uh, balance us out, right? And they, they help us to wire uh, our neurons to come together and to wire, to think good thoughts for ourselves. You know, when the system and we've had so much discrimination around us, we get to think those good thoughts for ourselves. We get to sometimes people have connections uh, with their relatives from the spirit world that come back and talk to them or connect to them or touch them. And, um, and at the end, we have a closing talking circle that's just a reflection of how it was for them. How, how was it to check into your body? What are you feeling or what came up for you? Um, what do we get to celebrate? And that is really strong medicine because we get to hear back from every single person in the circle. And, you know, oftentimes there are things that we don't necessarily want to say or feel like we can say, but somebody else does, you know, and it, it allows us to naturally build that kinship in our communities in this beautiful way. And so deep rest, um, is very important, right? And when we can't get the deep rest or the sleep, then we can get that um, non-sleep deep rest is what it's called when we're relaxing, you know, so that our bodies can come back. And, you know, the, that deep nourishment and even 20 minutes of a small little nap throughout the day can help to restore our bodies and how we're feeling. Um, but also it's important to nourish our bodies through traditional foods and through foods in general, <laughs> um, making sure that you're eating three to four meals a day, um, making sure that you have like your brain, your neurons, your thought process has the fuel that it needs every day. Um, and this is a picture of uh, some traditional foods that we made and it's uh, wild rice with sweet potatoes and a little bit of jerky, uh, deer jerky that I just, uh, we just soaked it in a little bit of water so that it wasn't so, so tough and mix it together and served it. And uh, that's my, that's our, our godson, Anua Fakli. And uh, he was just loving it. He just was loving it and grabbing it by the handfuls and shoving it in his mouth. And, you know, those little ones are a good reminder of like how we can just enjoy our food, <laughs> be thankful and enjoy that, you know, that that, that joy that, that, that food gives us and that connection that we have to this food when we make it. Um, and we make it from that connection comes from the lands that we are on or someone else's lands that we know are taking care of that food, um, how beautiful that can be and how we can start simple, you know, simple recipes, wild rice, you know, that just had a protein, a fat and a carbohydrate. So um, I put a little bit of maple syrup in it to give it a little bit of sweetness and, uh, and a little bit of, we cooked it in manteca or in lard. Um, and that's the, 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 kidney fat that we render um, together in community. And so it has a mix of those three things, the protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And I'm a big, if you haven't seen the traditional food series, it goes into in depth about why this combination is so important, but this allows us to have a complete meal. And when we have this complete meal, our body is, is nurtured and full, and it gives us um, everything that we need 
to absorb the different foods and allow us to, so that we don't have any sugar spikes. Because when we have those sugar dips is when we get really tired or exhausted and um, we feel that crash, right? And so um, having timers and setting timers regularly for your meals is really important. Here we are for uh, winter again. So I'm gonna ask for folks to take a moment to consider what are the different foods in your territory, your tradition that um, you are eating during the winter. No, I acknowledge from the chat as I'm catching up here uh, that Dr. Mark Sandemigo base says that the reason why we experience internal relaxation when watching a normal fire is according to the researchers because our mind is drawn into the flames. And the longer this happens, the more we let go of and jumble the jumble of our everyday concerns, non-distracted, peaceful state, anxieties are naturally reduced. All right. So some of the foods that are coming up, salmon, root vegetables, loop fisk, loop fisk, just kidding. Stew, home cooked meals, lots of wild rice soup, corn soup, fry bread with chili, yum. McDonald's, <laughs> gotta keep it real. <laughs> corn stew, venison squash. Grilling red meat, fry bread and soup. Dried corn soup, beef stew, deer, quail, pork, corn, jellies, jams, caribou, moose and more moose. Smoked roast, baked potatoes, trout, beautiful. This is a traditional food pyramid um, that is from the Anishinaabe territory. And they, it's uh, from this diabetes prevention and they really focus in on the different, the different uh, seasons. And so I really appreciate they do that because they uh, focus in on the seasons and then they want folks to focus on local, right? And it's a good model for all of us in our communities to um, consider that in the colder weather, we'll need heavier foods. So some of you all said venison, moose, um, bison, buffalo, um, and naturally occurring fat like lard and starches that are um, potatoes, which are native to uh, Abyayala, Turtle Island, these lands. And so they come from South America, winter squash, wild rice, um, and then also jerky, things that we've prepared for winter. So dried jerky, dried berries, corn, um, and then canned goods, right? And because the reality is um, some of us, um, all of us, you know, in one time or another, uh, we need to balance it out and we don't have the same connections to our lands. Um, it's not as easy to go hunt, you know, and um, we are rebuilding those connections to the hunters and a lot of the um, land has been privatized, quote unquote, purchased. And so it's really important for us to, we all are starting somewhere, right? And so definitely like having grace on ourselves for ourselves in this process is really important. Um, but there is a piece about like eating locally and being able to, if you're not in a hot region where the citrus grows, um, that citrus is naturally you know they say especially in the winter vitamin c get it from your citrus and your oranges but that citrus is uh grows in a hot environment and it's meant to cool down the body so that's not something that we would want to be eating in the winter 
um, for example, right? Unless you live in that region and Florida is probably not gonna be <laughs> snowing right now <laughs> and it's appropriate you know, to you locally and, and to your people. Um, this is an example, I think for the number one thing, especially for mental health and for prevention um, is to really keep our mind right, right? And, and to be able to focus in on the number one thing that's gonna help us is to, is to get these good fats into our bodies as much as possible because that fat literally builds the sheath. They call it a myelin sheath around the neuron. Um, so all of these specialized brain cells, they have this fatty protection so that, the, um, so they can communicate and that fatty protection um, helps to protect our brain from degeneration, from Alzheimer's, but also uh, from having any kind of, from being tired or uh, being you know, depressed or having like this mood that we're like, oh, we're kind of in this funk. We don't really know how to get out of it. Um, and it also enhances our memory, you know? And so um, some of the ways that you can get some of these uh, fatty acids and the more that you can eat, the better. Um, I don't necessarily prescribe to, you know, taking these doses or anything, just the more that you can um, weave them into what you're eating each day, the better, the lard, the manteca, the, some of you mentioned the salmon and the trout, um, sardines is also um, accessible for a lot of folks that like really pack a punch, uh, if you can handle the taste, <laughs> uh, pecans, pine nuts, sunflowers, purslane, chia seeds. So these are all um, traditional foods that help us from this land to help us, um, and from this land, I mean, from Alaska to uh, Abya Yala to South America, you know, that our, our bodies are used to digesting and seeing. Um, and so our body knows how to, um, how to integrate that and so that we, our bodies can heal themselves in essence. And also for folks that are under constant high stress and have anxiety, uh, the omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA. If you can access some of these supplements or if tribal, you know, some of these tribes have funding to access this for the youth or for these programs, if this is highly recommended and something that will definitely um, change and support um, that healing in our communities. As far as carbohydrates, so it's protein, carbohydrates, and good fat. So good fat is a must. Carbohydrates, some of the vegetables and grains you want to, we talked about for winter, our bodies are wanting warming foods. So this would be sweet potatoes, wild roots, uh, camas, cattails, um, also corn, wild rice, lentils, beans, and squash, winter squash, and dandelion greens. Um, so we I, I listed these below because these are the amaranth and the quinoa and the oats are really nutritious and they have some protein and they pack a punch, uh, but they are cooling. Um, so you can also make them in, a, in like an atole kind of a way where it's like the blue corn mush. Some people know it as blue corn mush or an atole where it's like a corn soup. Some of you all mentioned uh, with the powder or even you know as a stew as well. But we want to go easy with the sugar. <laughs> and this is really important. Um, I'm not sure if some of you have experienced and the folks that you've been working with in prevention that when they first are um, coming off of any substance that they there tends to be this bridge of sugar that happens. So it's like a sugar binge or like, oh, I just noticed as soon as I stopped doing, you know, drinking alcohol or what have you, I just went at it with the sugar. And that's, um, it's really important for us to remember that sugar is toxic. <laughs> it's toxic to our bodies. Um, and it has a dual function. It does actually connect with the opiate receptors, the same ones that a lot of these substances connect to. So the sugar replaces where, where the substance is not being consumed anymore, the sugar can replace and activate those same receptors. And that's why there's kind of this spike in sugar intake um, when folks are transitioning off of substances. Um, and it's, it's a very similar biological process within the body. And so one thing that we all need to be aware of, especially um, in with our communities of prevention is to make sure that we are 
staying clear and staying away from high fructose corn syrup, sucrose, dextrose, fructose, processed sugar in general as much as possible because that processed sugar is 99.5% sugar and 0.5% water. Traditionally, our sugars like cane sugar um, has, you know, 35 to, I forgot the exact percentage, but it's um, the percentage of water is anywhere from 30 to 70%, I believe. Um, so it's, it's a big difference. It's a really big difference of how much sugar we're getting at once from processed sugar. And so it's really important to know that sugar can actually alter our behavior. And it can make us think when we're detoxing from sugar or when we don't have sugar, and our body needs it, we can be going through these same kind of withdrawal symptoms. And we need to be aware of that, right? And to be able to um, make sure that folks aren't overdoing it with the processed sugar, because then those withdrawal symptoms start to um, create this roller coaster for us and especially for our folks, uh, for our communities. And so being able to really encourage more holistic sugars um, that our body is used to consuming, uh, like honey, maple syrup, mesquite, and sugar cane to sweeten our teas, our uh, anything that we're making, our goodies for this this season. You know, when we there is a real thing to feed ourselves sugar when we want to feel better. And again, since it hits those opiate receptors, we we tend to do that in this season where there's a lot of grief and where there, we have to go inward and our attention comes back on us and we're having to process these emotions and these traumas. And so um, being able to find a middle of the road and still have our goodies, but making sure that they are traditional foods that our bodies are used to seeing and that also come with their own beautiful set of uh, vitamins and minerals that keep us healthy and strong and balanced. Um, and the honey and the maple syrup, you know, also has its own uh, traditions and ceremonies that connect us to the earth as well. Um, so even, so I'm not saying no sugar, <laughs> I'm just saying to be choiceful, right, of the sugars, especially with our populations. Traditional meats, fish, birds, insects. Um, we talked a little bit about this. I think one of the things I didn't see in the chat was like duck, but um, wild game is definitely uh, if you can access caribou, moose, elk, bison, deer, venison, some folks said, um, it's incredible um, being able to restore that relationship with these animals and um, treat them with respect and nourishing um, are, are really incredible, making those connections and supporting the uh, sanctuaries of the bison and in our territories is incredibly important for our survival on this planet. Um, Organ meats, I, when we do postpartum work for folks, we, and folks that really need a lot of nourishment, so folks that are just coming off of dependencies, um, it's really important to give them deep, deep nourishment. And so organ meats is a really wonderful way to nourish them deeper. Um, and the bone broth is something that is also wonderful um, that the bone is is really memory right and so that bone when we're um, able to have either make it in a soup or make just the bone broth by itself that it's incredibly nourishing and it's a meal within itself and you'll see that it already has some of the natural oils in it and it's um, really high in calcium and really incredible food um, for for all of our people the elders anyone that's sick um, all of us and then you see the salmon and the cod and uh, different. And if you don't have access again to any uh, to these traditional foods um, and, you know, we're all in the process of rebuilding those connections that if you, the one thing that you can consider is just focusing in on white meat, low fat, low sodium. So for those of us, you know, that are still uh, that we are going to the grocery store, we're going to the market, we have to drive 30 minutes to the market off the res. Um, just focusing in on making sure that we're focusing in on, on white meat that's low fat and low sodium helps us to be more balanced and stronger um, with physically um, and in our, uh, in our bodies for our nourishment. This is a traditional food pyramid from the Anishinaabe that we talked about. It just kind of gives you an overlay of you know, everything that we talked about, really considering uh, making sure that we're combining 
the protein, fat, good fat, right? It has to be a good fat, <laughs> healthy fat, right? And uh, carbohydrate, uh, the PFC uh, is really what we want to focus on. And as much as we can, I'm just going to highlight in this bottom part, it's, it talks about um, breast milk for babies, that that's a traditional food and that we honor and we support um, all of the life givers that are in that process as well. And then I'll just go ahead and close with this uh, healing and community that, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, before, uh, well, I'll share where we are with our community and the things that we do. Um, and then we'll allow you all to have a breakout sharing session. Um, is that I'm curious, you know, what are the different ways that you all come together in community and do your thing? <laughs> Again, you know, a lot of the elders just say, hey, be who we are. <laughs> it sounds really simple and it's really, you know, simple message that comes from our ceremonies, um, but really walking that in our daily life, um, considering the system, uh, the systems that are here that have been forced upon us, right? Um, what does that look like for us? And what are the, the smallest, what's the smallest thing that we can do to start to uh, grow our traditions and our community and, and, that, and for us to really walk them? And so in this picture um, is our Yanawana prayer run group, part, some of us. Uh, we have an ancestor run every September. And we honor, we run to the different missions where uh, peoples, indigenous peoples and people, other peoples as well, um, indigenous from this, this land and other lands as well, gave their lives, um, you know, and were taken into slavery. So we go and we honor those places and we pray for our ancestors um, every year. And so, you know, that's also important for us to have a goal in mind, right? Of like, why are we doing something? What's the bigger picture? And so in September, um, two years ago when the pandemic happened, uh, we actually started to meet up uh, outside and we were like, we just want to come together and prepare for this run in September. And so um, we, we would start by having this gathering and all ages came. Um, and we had this circle and we started with this circle and everyone gets to express themselves in the circle. One of the elders smudges us. Um, we all get to express ourselves. And then we do what now has become called a, a unity walk. And so um, once we all express ourselves, it's just amazing how there's a shift of, we see each other and we're able to cry together this last Sunday when we, that, that day that the picture's from, um, it was raining. And so we naturally, just a lot of us were a lot more open and really like sharing the real things, the grief that's happening. Someone just had a diagnosis of um, breast cancer. Um, someone else, uh, a young person um, lost their best friend because they took their life they were 18 years old you know all of these things are happening in our community and, and we as a community you know we have ceremonies that can help us with this but I also feel like these gatherings of us being able to hold each other and to listen and to witness and acknowledge each other needs to actually happen more often um, so that we can really give ourselves that time to process what we need to and as we see each other in these mirrors it's really we learn so much you know, we learn different ways that people are getting through life and, and what they've gone through and the and you know and then we do this walk this unity walk around the lake so we're there with this water and with the water and we get to be with the ducks and we get to learn from the duck medicine and the water birds. And um, it's a re really wonderful chance for us to walk together um, and, and be together. They call it the unity walk. That name just came out, right? Because um, the elders uh, don't run necessarily. There are a couple that do, but there are some that 
um, have diabetes and they can't feel their feet and all of these things and some that have come in wheelchairs and we take we all go together that first lap and then the second if and then if folks want to run then they do a, a jog and we run together and we sing songs and we share and we just connect you know we connect together with each other and with the elements and uh, we're nourished you know we've been nourished and I've seen how having this having this just gathering just setting the time to gather the first Sunday of the month and then as the run gets closer we start together every weekend um, that it's kept us it's kept us balanced it's kept us uh, being able to slip down those slippery slides of anxiety and all of the things that isolation um, has done to us in our communities, living this unnatural way of life. And so it's been really beautiful to, to experience this, right? And um, we just come and we talk and we walk around the lake. <laughs> We're keeping it simple, right? Um, so I wanna encourage each and every one of you, if you don't already do something on a regular basis, you know, that this, um, that you start to think about like, what is it that you can do um, well, also, what are your gifts? What are you, what's the medicine that you have? What do you gravitate to? Is it cooking? You know, do you want to cook with several people and restore that connection to that home fire and provide and gift food in the community? Uh, do you want to have beadwork parties? You know, some, some of these things can happen indoors and you're sharing a skill um, and a traditional um, art form, storytelling. I know that in some of the coming weeks, you all are going to hear from some storytellers and some um, artisans. So it's really exciting. And I just wanted to close with this breakout question. And if Dr. Bates, you could help me with this breakout, just that folks can connect with each other. Um, what are three things that stood out to you? And what are three ways that you can care for yourself and others while transitioning into winter? Those of you that are still on, we thank you for staying with us. We are about 15 minutes left, and I'm going to try a transition to the breakout so you can participate with others in the group. Thank you for your patience. Welcome back, everybody. It's being recorded. Welcome back. Dr. Kasada, you want to bring it to a close? I'm sure. We just wanted to hear back from folks. If you would either like to type in the chat, maybe we can hear maybe one or two people um, share a few people with their voice before we close. Any insights or ways I'd like that to share? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, my name is Jean. I am located, um, I am Hukapati Oyate at Dakota, and I'm located on Fort Tom, in Fort Thompson, South Dakota. And what I have done for youth groups and for adults is I do, um, I encourage writing. I started out as storytelling, both modern and traditional. And, you know, they might just say they, you know, how they had a flat tire, they went into town and, um, how they it taught them that they need to look keep a wrench in the car. That's a short story, you know. That's um, but what I did is I got inexpensive small notepads they can put in their pockets or purses, pens, mechanical pencils, colored pencils. I got black uh, blank notepads and then just um, the composition book that are like fifty cents each. And I talked to them and I have a short outline about how to get people to write down their thoughts, their expressions, both positive, negative, their goals is where you want to get them. And plus it encourages uh, natives to think about writing. We have so few Native American authors. And so I also, you know, I refer them to some books that I've read. And then I'm starting a book club. And that was per the uh, people in my community. They, they like to read books and so um, but yeah, I'm excited for that. But I, I just want to encourage people to get some note, notepads and some pens out there to your um, groups because uh, writing helps people not only uh, think about their own thoughts, but to get thoughts out that they didn't know they had or they need to get rid of. So that's all. Thank you. Pidamaya. Thank you, Jean, for sharing. 
Any other thoughts? We had some good comments in the chat throughout the session. And so um, one of them, if you could address briefly, is about uh, the applicability for Dr. Yellowbird's book. I think that was Joy that had the comment. Yeah, thank you for, for that share, Jean. And it's, it's true, writing is really um, allows us that that reflection time and to get it out because not everybody feels comfortable just like speaking right away. Um, so thank you for that. And yes, for that question for Dr. Yellowbird, I, I personally believe that colonization has taken a toll on all of us, um, even colonizers. It's been, um, and it requires healing on all of our parts and it requires us to all work together and that the, Dr. Yellowbird gives us a lot of language about what those effects of colonization are and how they affect our bodies physiologically um, so that folks can also um, question what is this, you know, if you're not an indigenous person from this land that has experienced colonization in this way, how it still has separated you if you're from a different place to um, really consider what are some things that come from your tradition? You know, what are some things that come from where you are from, whether you're European descent or what, what have you to consider, you know, because colonization is literally ripped apart, um, ripped us from our relationships. And so it's important, our relationships mm -hmm. to the elements, and it's important for all of us as humans to restore that. Um, because we need everybody. We need everybody to make sure that we can continue to live on this land, on this earth. And it's important for us to know how we can help each other and be open to that. And right now it's really important for folks that have access. Like if you um, are someone that has access to this system to stop it, to reverse it, to pro you know, do what's right and, and help to restore and heal this process. Um, that it will give you language to be able to step into that and hold space for Indigenous people to do what we need to do um, to be who we are. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, there were every episode also has a response as well. Important knowledge to read and understand the position of healing for our people, especially those practitioners that are non-Native working with American Indian Alaska Native clients. Narrow decolonization builds on the idea that healthy constructive thoughts, emotions, and behaviors can improve our brains and lives. Many indigenous completive practices incorporate the same principles and processes as mindfulness approaches and are important components of physical, emotional, behavior, and spiritual well-being. Thank you for that. So Joy's gonna add that to her book list and hopefully everybody else will take some time to look at that. Um, <laughs> another common question or um, comment in the chat was regarding the connection between sugar and opioid receptors. And I know you addressed that before in one of our sessions, but if um, you could just share with the folks that you'll be providing us some resources. Yes, um, that's a really, it seems like a really good question, right? Um, so as a background in pharmacy, uh, we know that the opiate receptors, the mu opiate receptors are the ones that um, the opiates attach to and the, the sugar, the processed sugar actually attached to that same mu opiate receptor. And so that link that's on there for the, um, in, within the embedded into the presentation will take you to this huge article <laughs> and it talks all about it um, in depth about how that works and, and why that works. And you all have also perked my interest to do more research on that because um, as a pharmacist, I'm fascinated as well about, um, you know, could sugar be a way that we kind of help people to wean off, right? So that it's not as, as painful for them to, to wean off opiates or dependencies. Um, you know, could we use it in this way that it becomes medicine, you know, when we're figuring out um, how to use it appropriately, right? Or we're um, also using some of these traditional sugars that um, 
that help us to have more of more minerals and vitamins into the body. But I can add that um, I'll also look for other um, other papers. That one's the most comprehensive paper, but I'll look for other presentations as well um, to really to embed into the presentation when we send that out, make that available to everyone. This has been a great opportunity for us to hear some good commentary in the chat as well as in the breakout rooms and the wealth of knowledge that Dr. Casada brings to our, our community. I want to thank everybody who's been on the line with us since one o'clock Central Standard Time. We know that we value your time. We, we know that you have um, communities to serve. We ask for your patience as we wrap this up with an opportunity for song um, through uh, a prayer through song to bring this together because we know in the future on the next few months, we'll continue the conversations building on this content of the important way that we can continue to be good relatives to one another. Um, there's important ways that we can look at this from the perspective of how we help each other. You're welcome to reach out to our center directly. Our email address is there at the top, the CPH. If you couldn't find the link on our websites because it had a glitch. It is now fixed, but I put the link here on the screen. If you go to our Prevention Technology Transfer Center website, the registration is up there now and is available for registration for our next session on December 20th. It's really important to know that um, all the experts that are gonna be presenting are drawing their knowledge base from our culture, from our tradition, so that we can continue to help each other one other comment that I want to address that somebody put in the chat was to be inclusive of our youth. And that's really important to our team um, to hit the lifespan across all ages and stages. And so, yes, we want to be inclusive of our young people, of our, our teens, our, our youth, um, our young adults, midlife, and our elderly. So all of our experts are gonna be addressing different things in different age categories. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Casada for being with us on the line. Please be sure to take some time today to um, respond to our post-event survey. It's very helpful to us to know that we can continue to provide service to you all. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon, great rest of your week. Look forward to seeing you all back on December 20th. You will get the follow-up email with contact information for Dr. Casada, the slide deck, and a certificate of attendance is available, as well as um, those of you who are needing certificates for your CEUs, you'll get all that information and a follow-up email. Thank you so much. Have a great day.